hand out sheets. Lesson number 21 already, already. We're in the book of Daniel. And it is, I think, the most appealing, fascinating, and popular works of inspired Scripture. Uh, as with all the studies, what we're doing is kind of surveying the whole Old Testament, book by book, from, from 10,000 feet. I like that illustration. We're just flying over, state by state, 10,000 feet, looking at the terrain. But we are getting uh, some key themes as we dive down to look at a few key portions and go back up so that we can be familiar with the terrain and comfortable with the whole Old Testament. And I think that we are becoming more familiar with it uh, gradually. And that's good. We're less intimidated by something that we actually study and uh, go to quite often. So I hope that this study tonight motivates you to appreciate Daniel more than ever, not only for his prophetic work, but I hope that you appreciate the man, Daniel, a lot more. I'll be focusing a lot on the man, Daniel. When did he live? What was his prophetic work timeline? Uh, some of us are uh, really good with dates, and some people like me have to just pound them into my head over and over and over repetitiously until I get it. Well, if you look at the date 604 to 535, wait, what? You're looking at a time span here of just before and all the way through the entirety of the Babylonian captivity. This man, Daniel, was one of the captives in the first waves from the beginning all the way. This man lived during that era incredible and likely to be just a little bit more than a hundred years old perhaps and he lived a little bit afterwards but from the very beginning from a young man just before all the way through his lifespan uh, comprised that period so he was called to prophesy to judah but technically judah wasn't a nation anymore it was there the faithful remnant was taken captive so yes he's prophesying to the people of judah when they're not in jerusalem anymore the book of Daniel. I thought that there'd be some great guy. John is a good man. He's a great guy. Some of you who are watching with the trimmed video, I was trying to clear my throat before class. This is very welcomed. Notice the one line summary. <clears throat> That's living water right there. Thank you. Daniel. The one sentence summary is, he was a high ranking wise man in Babylon or Persia telling about Israel's future. And he did. You think that's the case of all of them, aren't, uh, isn't it? But his unique circumstance will come out to us in the course of this study, and I think you'll find it very appreciative. Uh, the major assignment for reading is the whole book. The minor assignment this time is the whole book. I want you to enjoy every bit of it. It doesn't take too long to read. Uh, unless you get bogged down with the details, the outlines will help you stay focused, but it's so exciting. And after this class, maybe more so, some of the major themes to listen for is the ultimate victory to the God's kingdom and uh, how God rules over all kingdoms. We know this, but to hear this, you're just taken captive. You feel like the enemies are taking over. Is God not as powerful? Why is this letting, you know, why is this even happening? And then you're reminded that God still rules over the kingdoms of men. Even angels take part and share in the gospel's plan of salvation. There's a great danger in excessive pride with Nebuchadnezzar, of course. Uh, faith will also equip a person to meet every challenge. And we will see that tonight and face it with integrity. Uh, God's will will be done and God's kingdom will be possessed by ultimately you and I, the people in Christ. Amazing how God has fulfilled all this. But some of the key themes, major lessons as well, kind of overlap. Daniel is written to teach Gentile and the Hebrew of the sovereignty of God, that God's people will be delivered and the Messiah will come. Even Sir Isaac Newton said, quote, Christianity itself may be said to be founded on the prophecies of Daniel. And he goes on to illustrate how wonderful that is. Daniel and Ezekiel are very much alike in that it resembles the language of the New Testament revelation. We will obviously deal with that in the second half of our class. So from the Pentateuch, the establishment of God's people as a nation through all their history of the land of conquest, the judges, uh, the, the monarch, the kingdom, the united kingdom under Saul, David, and Solomon, under which a lot of the poetry was written, and throughout their whole history after the nation divided, for sure, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, you have all these prophets, and each one of them foretold of the Christ who would come, and we see Christ 
even in Daniel. I draw your attention to how Daniel talks about, most, most uh, vividly, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, that small stone that was not made by human hands, which crushed all the others and enveloped the entire earth. And that's the kingdom of Christ, and it is still here to this day. To see Christ in Daniel, the short of it is to say he's the Son of Man. But to think of the term Son of Man before he was incarnate makes you think, how were they perceiving this? That God would send a Savior. God would send the Messiah. And we know him to be Jesus, of course, now looking back. But Christ in Daniel, here's a big screen to let you reference and screenshot later if you want to study all these verses, that Jesus is the God in flesh Lamb who came to establish his kingdom, and it's God himself who came to save us. Incredible. And this is all themed in Daniel. Only the period of captivity, so you're contemporary with Ezekiel and, of course, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, who for the most part was still in Jerusalem, prophesying to the people there, but Daniel, of course, was taken in the first wave, and we know the history well. So for time's sake, let's skip this and get into our study on the introduction page. Uh, just some information for you here. Let's focus on the man, Daniel. And I'm going to share some extra details. Some say that Daniel is a combination book. It's a combination book in that it is really two-in-one works. Um, some say it's a combination book because, well, some of it's easy to understand and some of it's not. <laughs> Uh, some of it's easy to preach and teach, and some of these stories are what parents and Sunday school teachers teach kids. And we cherish these stories our whole lives. Uh, stories like how Daniel's friends, uh, not bowing and not burning. Daniel keeps praying while the lions keep resting. Uh, we know those stories very well. The accounts of Daniel and his friends help to establish also some basic teachings of godly Christian character that should define our whole walk with God. And that's why we go to Daniel so much, at least the first half of it, because those stories are so powerful and they get across those Christian virtues so vividly. It's a two-in-one book also because from chapters 7 through 12, this is what's interesting, and I recently had to be reminded of this, it's writing style changes. We know it's apocalyptic, but it's during those chapters, 7 through 12, that it shifts to that special genre of apocalyptic dreams and visions, like Ezekiel, yes, but also like the New Testament revelation. If you understand one, you can understand both pretty well, and it's fulfilled in Christ. That helps you understand it best. So in another way that it's a two-in-one book is that it is in two languages. Our copies, of course, are in English but it's originally in two languages. That is so rare in Old Testament books, but is also so indicative and well reflects the dual cultures of Daniel, the situation he's in, and the circumstance of the entire nation. The first half is written in Aramaic. That's a Babylonian language. But the second half is in Hebrew. And I encourage you to be encouraged by how the prophecies are written in Hebrew I just find it more than coincidental that that portion of the prophecies to be fulfilled is in his own uh, original language, the language of his people. <laughs> so, the influence of Babylonian captivity, some extra notes here um, if you wanted to list them this way. The captivity on the people of Judah and the Jewish people as a history as a whole can't be overstated. It is uh, incalculable. The Babylonian captivity occurred in three phases. You've heard this so much because it's so significant. The first deportation was in 606 B.C. Then it was, of course, 10 years later, 597-ish. And then 586 was the last time that the whole uh, Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed. Daniel was taken in that first wave from the very beginning, along with thousands of others. But I want you to imagine the population of a country moving into another place, and you have deaths every day, you have births every day. So over 70 years, 70 years, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to have the key change of language. The kids are learning the, from the schools of Babylon. They're going to learn Aramaic. And that's a major shift in Jewish culture. Even if you hold to the faith, you're going to learn the language. And over time, 
This does become their language all the way to the time of Christ, and historically, since that time, all the way till about 1940-ish or so, right? Uh, I'll get to that in a minute. Major shift. So, after 70 years, 536, you can go home if you want to. Those who could return home didn't know Hebrew. The result is that for 400 plus years of not knowing Hebrew, letting others transcribe the word, which led to problems as we know in Jesus' day, but still, it started off good. <laughs> the incarnate word of God himself, Jesus, spoke Aramaic, a Babylonian language. And it all goes back to this. Now, obviously, Jesus knew Hebrew. He knew it. But he spoke the language of the people. And we sometimes forget that. It goes all the way back to the captivity. And it's reflected here in Daniel because of how the first half is written in Arabic. So that's cool. Jesus, uh, the Jews continued to speak it up until the 1940s. And you know why? Because Israel became a state. And they had to decide, what's our language going to be? And then they had to go back and dust off some teachings of Hebrew to learn it again. And now, all these years later, wow, many years later, um, th that's what they know. And English, eh, people can hear it, but they know Hebrew. So they had to decide and learn it anew. Here's another huge impact of the captivity, the synagogue. We can't imagine, we can't begin to uh, imagine the impact they had and the struggle that they were facing because... The temple worship was so integral to their uh, culture. Worship as a Jewish people, those who were faithful and faithfully worshiping God. Okay, it's connected to temple worship. Worshiping God, worshiping in the temple, it's one and the same almost. And they even said in Jeremiah, he would say that you're trusting in the temple, focus on God. And so they had to you know, be directed that way for sure, like human nature would be. But the faithful few would say, We're, we don't have a temple anymore. We're, the Jews as a people are separated from the temple, so how do they worship God? Okay, they decided to assemble in some very basic, uh, inornate uh, structures or gatherings. And they decided to simply have Scripture be read, Psalms be sung, and prayers be prayed. Sound familiar? Uh, yeah. It's from that time on they continued to sing a cappella. They didn't go back after that, from this, to this day, actually, the Jews. Uh, also, the captivity influenced a role called the scribes. Before then, you wouldn't have even needed one. But sadly, they did. Why? Because the people, the Judah clan, after a while, didn't know Hebrew. They couldn't read the Torah and translate it. They couldn't interpret it. So, some could, and those who could, gave, yes, to their credit, gave their full focus to the letter of the law, and they focused on it. It started out as a real good thing, so that's good. But if you depend on others to tell you what the Word says, ah, that's a recipe for disaster. And we know all about the Sadducees and the Pharisees in the time of Christ. It came to be that. But why did they need those? Because the language was Aramaic, they couldn't read Hebrew, and a scribe was needed. So, many of these influences, those are the major ones. But on the other hand, and on the outline, let's just focus on the name. The name of the book is written by the one who wrote it. And Daniel's name means God is judge, or God is my judge. Well, if God is judge, that means he is my judge, and I have to face that. And Daniel did. Daniel never forgot his Hebrew name. And Daniel never forgot the meaning of it. I love it. So he was born to a wealthy family, a wealthy noble family in Judah. And uh, among thousands taken captive, he was in the first. We mentioned this. Daniel became distinguished for government service. Okay, detail time. King Nebuchadnezzar was ruling Babylon. And desiring to um, conquer a nation is very bold to bring Judah, to bring Jerusalem with him um, in phases. But still, that's, that's a, you're just asking for trouble, a morale issue. So he was very astute, and to his credit, he was a very shrewd politician. So his strategy was, I'm going to develop good relations with the people I enslave by uh, making great relations with a few key people who will be my liaisons. And that is clever. He looked for some of the brightest and the best among the Jews, 
people who would be honest and upright and not look him in the eye and, and tell him lies about how things are going or just be, you know, just be full of integrity. He was looking for those kind of people who would be loyal to him in terms of civic affairs. But for these people to be who he needed them to be, they needed special training. And it wasn't long until Daniel stood out. He was selected for his new role in the honorable court. That's how it came about. And that's why and that's how Daniel learned a new language at, at the age of the young man that he was, uh, likely in his late teens, but um, very young. So he's given a new name, Belteshazzar, and Daniel never uses it in the book. I find that interesting. But perhaps that's also very telling of how he knew who his identity was. He knew his history, and history and identity go hand in hand. He knew his history. He knew who he was. He knew whose he was, and that's very telling. But perhaps, um, perhaps we would be uh, better honoring his three friends, who we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Perhaps if we speak their Hebrew names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That's Daniel 1, 7. But with those new names does come new responsibilities. So Daniel was so blessed to serve under Nebuchadnezzar, but also his successor king, Belshazzar. And then after the Babylonians were overtaken by the Medes and the Persians, you have the vassal king, Darius. And Daniel's service and prophetic work spanned literally the duration of the 70-year captivity. And I dread to think uh, where the faithful remnant of Judah's focus would have gone to if it were not for Daniel's work to keep them focused and encouraged. Uh, so I know that God worked through him and helped countless people, but he gets uh, the credit and spotlight tonight. But here's the best thing about Daniel. Throughout his career of serving in a foreign land, uh, people with powerful officials all around you, worshiping false gods, a lot like Joseph, you can make a comparison here between Daniel and Joseph. He never compromised his faith. And that's why I respect Daniel in a way like I respect few others. Uh, I've mentioned before that the Bible is blatantly honest about its heroes. Even David, Marvin Serrett is teaching on David in the other side of the building tonight. And the Bible's quite blatant about his faults, right? And yet there's something about Daniel. No doubt he was human and, and humans have flaws. But the beauty of Scripture is that it upholds, by inspiration, his integrity. And, and we can apply it to us. Had we been taken captive so young, would we have had such devotion and trust and love for God to stay intact and stay faithful to Him? Or would we have questioned God or just go along to get along and adapt to survive and not make any waves? But, but that, that's like so many, but not Daniel. And uh, no, not Daniel. I mean, we see this early on. Others accused God, abandoned God, but Daniel said, I trust in you to see me through. Chapter 1, verses 8 through 16. Chapter 1, verses 8 through 16 is where we can see an account of him being selected and trained and being presented um, some food from the king. Graciously presented. Here's, here's food from the king. Um, you know, it's a gracious thing. You know, if someone's offering you something, it's uh, that, that pressure of, well, I don't really want to eat it, but I don't want to be rude and be offensive, right? You, we've all been there. Uh, but they were in that to the utmost because this is a king and he has captured you. This is just the way it is. So what are you going to do? Would we have yielded to the pressure and compromised our convictions? Or would we have been like Daniel to respectfully say, I cannot eat that? And there are some speculations as to why. Uh, did it go against some of their diet code uh, uh, given in the Levitical system? Like was it a pork product, for example? Well, that could have been. Contextually, there's another more probable idea, and that is that if it was in the king's courts, it was likely tainted by having been dedicated to false gods. And either way, Daniel was a man of honor and integrity, and it was not going to happen. He says, um, we're not going to do this. We have to stay true. And was it not a person of integrity that Nebuchadnezzar's looking for? Well, so all this on the surface 
sounds bad. You're putting yourself in a dangerous situation, but it turned out to be a blessing for him. <laughs> he negotiated with the person who was in charge, and you know this well, that he says, let us just eat you know, this, this regiment over here and this, this diet, this conscionable, conscionable diet, and let's just see what happens. And that was granted. So after time, it was evident that God blessed Daniel and his friends a lot more, more with greater strength and greater results and greater health than the others. And you'll again enjoy chapter 5. Chapter 5. By now, Nebuchadnezzar had passed. Uh, Belshazzar is ruling, and he's throwing a wild party. I mean, drinking, carefree time, basking in their power, anything goes. But when suddenly, <laughs> handwriting mysteriously begins to appear on the wall, and everyone gasps. They don't know what. Mani, mani, to kill up hearts and means. But they know Daniel, and they know his history. Bring him in. He'll tell us. Well, Daniel could have feared for his life, and knowing the occasion of the night, not share news that they wouldn't want to hear. Uh, it, it means, uh, it means uh, someone was shortchanged. No. He told them what it means. This phrase's meaning for you means that your kingdom will be overthrown tonight. And it was. Daniel is a bold man. Uh, by this time, under the third king, Darius, when Persia takes over, Darius greatly respected Daniel. That's something to, to note. Uh, Daniel was loved by, by uh, this person, very respected as, as a, uh, for his character. But the gestures in uh, Darius' court hated him. And as true to the nature of the contrast between good and evil, they conspire to use Daniel's devotion towards his God as his weakness to uh, facilitate their plot. And the essential element to accomplish their evil deed was their, his prayer time. His prayer time. They manipulated Darius to summon a decree that no one was to pray to any other god but him for a particular time. And in chapter 6, we see that Daniel chose to do exactly what he has always done. He went to his room and he prayed to his God. Whew. Reading this story or hearing this account gets my blood boiling. Uh, that's all I'm going to say right now. But I'm sure happy with its outcome on both counts, really. I only wish that others had repented, but that's not going to happen. Faithful no matter what. That's a theme. Daniel could have died this way, being thrown into the lion's den. But he had a faith that said, no matter what, faithfulness. In addition to maintaining his integrity, I always give, he always gives credit to God. I would like to read a portion from chapter 2. Chapter 2, verses 27 through 30. I'll read from the NKJV this time. Verse 27, chapter 2. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king had de has demanded, the wise men and the astrologers, the magicians and the soothsayers, none of these people can declare to the king what this means. He's emphasizing no one else can do this. But there is a God in heaven. And I love the power and meaning of that phrase in this moment. There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Do you realize the implication of what he just said? He, he gave credit again to the fact that he believes his God is the God among all, and all these others aren't. And Daniel was just that bold and respectful as well. Verse 29, as for you, O king. Yes, I skipped a little bit of that verse 28, but that's fine. Let's go to 29. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. Verse 30, but as for me, he goes on to say, I, I'm not any better than anybody else, but give credit to God. God is the one that's wanting you to see the thoughts and understand what is in your heart. Wow. So he gives credit to Jehovah God. And that's something about Daniel the man that we need to appreciate. Well, the class could be over, but we have a few highlights to continue. Point C, the purpose of the book. Uh, why was it written? 
It was written to fill the purposes to allow captive Judah to know their immediate and long-term future. Why am I here? How long am I going to be here? What's going to happen to me? What's God's plan? In my words, God is saying, Judah, all these, pol uh, these political kingdoms of earth will come and go, but you must remain God's people. You must remain my people. Just stay faithful to me. I'll, I'll stay faithful to you. Point C2, for all of us, the purpose is to show the sovereign power of God and His providential hand to bring about His will. It's always going to be that case. Whatever God's will is, whether He reveals it to us or not, <laughs> ultimately His will was to bring about Christ, and He did. So we have to remember that. But on point section 2, this is the key, the sovereignty of God. That's the main message of all of Daniel, I think. It really lifts him up as the sovereign God, the Almighty over all. And only the Almighty can allow human choice and still work through any person, through any nation to accomplish His will. The Messiah was His ultimate will for salvation. And it has happened. But I will also say, I'm not going to limit God. Based on my ignorance, that's foolish. Even today, I would say that His purposes and His sometimes perhaps punishments, can often extend the boundaries of our vision. Stated more maybe professionally, His sovereignty transcends what we can often see in the provincial and the transient, our own time and place. Let's not limit God, but let's keep it in perspective. God works in amazing ways, and we don't always know those ways. We don't always think what matters is like Daniel. What matters? Stay faithful. Through Daniel, God told Nebuchadnezzar and to us that He is the great I Am. And from that point forward, over the next 500 or so years, <laughs> almost 500 years, nations will rise and fall, but that will not stop my plan. And in fact, God would use Babylon and Persia and Greece and Rome all to accomplish His purposes. And the Messiah came, and God remains sovereign. So whatever happens in our world affairs today, our primary concern is staying faithful. That's what it's about. Uh, God encourages us with Romans 8, 28. I added that verse, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are the call according to His purpose, which is defined in verse 29. But only a sovereign God could take the, I heard it said, the loose strings that we leave dangling from our mess-ups and work them through a heavenly tapestry to bring about great blessing. Only God can do that. And indeed, He can and does. I want to encourage you by reading this, uh, or not reading, but showing you all these verses that you can screenshot and read. And as you read, you will see how God is spotlighted as the Most High, ruling over all. And the faithful remnant is encouraged to stay faithful to His kingdom because that's the kingdom that's going to endure. How long? Forever. There's no other kingdom other than one He has now for us, already established through Christ, that will endure. That's the kingdom I need to be a citizen of. On the outline section, this may help you keep His own history straight before transitioning to that symbolic dream and vision portion, but I want to share with you this screen, and you can kind of see on your own time, it's a topical outline, and you can see how, maybe appreciate how His faith was tested. His faith was put to the test facing challenges of customs and philosophies and pride and impiety and persecutors, and then not be confused with their uh, chronology of details of those revelations or those visions. So that, this, this is one of my favorite outlines from uh, the Look at the Book series, so I wanted to provide that for you visually. Let's cover some highlights as we conclude the next few minutes of class. Key theme A. The Interpreted Dream, Daniel chapter 2. Obviously, it lists four kingdoms to that point forward, and it would distinguish all kingdoms from God. So in that one vision, yes, it represented from that point forward to the Messiah coming, but it also distinguishes all kingdoms and lets us know that Christ is ruler over all. So here is Daniel's dream, visually. The image of the head of gold, chest and arms of silver, Belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet of iron and baked clay. Representing four successive powers. 
And looking back at history, it's pretty clear. Babylon <laughs> with Nebuchadnezzar, Persia, then Greece, then Rome. Did you know Alexander the Great prophesied in Scripture? <laughs> God knew it was going to happen, all that he did. But the dream involved something else. It involved a stone, small at first, carved out not by hands, but came down and just demolished that statue. And if you can visualize this in your mind's eye, that stone growing to about the size of planet Earth and enveloping it, God will establish His kingdom. And it's in the form of His forgiven saints added to Christ's church by their faith response in baptism. Isn't that great? Upon that faith that Jesus is who He says He is. Daniel chapter 7 contains a vision of four beasts with similar interpretation. I encourage you to look at it that way, and it makes a lot more sense. Uh, the atrocities committed by that fourth beast likely draws our attention to the intense persecution that Rome put, or that Rome became towards Christians. Some of the things that they did, uh, I just can't imagine. But Christianity prevailed. I would like to read verses 13 and 14. And as I do, you will, uh, because of what we know, we'll think about the ascension. I mean, we will think about the resurrection and the ascension. But how would they see this not yet knowing those details? Verse 13. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. How would the Messiah come? I don't understand. Uh, God? I, what's, what's the plan there? Coming with the clouds of heaven, He came to the Ancient of Days. Ancient of Days? That's, that's deity, the Father. And they brought Him near before him, then to him was given dominion and glory and, king, and a kingdom. All people's nations' language should serve him. His dominion is everlasting, won't pass away, shall not be destroyed. There it is. Maybe it makes more sense than we first thought. <laughs> point A3. Let me go back. I'm used to clicking for a point, but this time it's all on one slide on this one. Daniel chapter 8. You'll see a vision of a ram. And read about a he-goat or a shaggy goat. And just see if it doesn't make sense to look at these prophetic messages as the second and third kingdom. If you do, you'll realize that Daniel himself makes that own interpretation. So I'm thankful when the Bible interprets itself. The vision of the ram then would be the Medo-Persian Empire. And the shaggy goat would be Greece. And if that's consistent, then if we stay on track... And we'll conclude our whole series with a lot of great stories about these two people of history. I'm going to mention them now. We will see Alexander the Great as the shaggy goat. We will see Antiochus or Antiochus Epiphanes as the small hour. And if you read it that way, it just makes so much more sense. And it, preser it prevents you from being swayed by what others would love to pre uh, pretend to know. But for now, the second theme is the 70 weeks. This is interesting now. This one's, a, this one's a, a whopper. 70 weeks of Daniel chapter 9. The interpretation of the 77s is highly disputed. It's written apocalyptically, so we shouldn't be surprised. But it is pictured as there will be messianic work at the end of 70 weeks, or 77s. And there's a myriad of theories, most of which I believe are described by the Greek word baloney. And I'm just being funny on that. I'm not the type of guy, obviously, who wants to, as I quote, go off the rails, chase half clues to discover the meaning of keys that we've long since lost. Indiana Jones is uh, one of my favorite franchise movies to enjoy watching, but I'm not going to do that in real life. But if it's in Scripture, I will stand on what it stands for. So, what does it mean? Having said that, there are interesting ideas that I will share. Here's one idea. Some claim that the 70 weeks are a number of years, or an exact number of years, and we get to play some number of games here, multiplying 70 times 7 equals 490. 490. And if that means years, it's conveniently fitting within the timeline for sure. It's a convenient fit. If you'd like to see it written out for you, here is the script. Since this prophecy talks about Jerusalem and, being, and Israel being rebuilt, okay, that's the prophecy, that's what it's about, then if we begin with the decree of Artaxerxes to Ezra to say yes in 458 to rebuild the temple. Moving forward with 69 times 7, you have 483 years. Just 7 years off, but if you add those numbers up, that is 26 AD 
when Jesus began His earthly ministry, and the remaining seven years, they will say, is just now symbolic as a number, representing the, the summary period of the work He has left to do. So again, I'm thinking, uh, well, that's convenient. It sounds good. Make of that what you want. But uh, yeah, um, I'm more concerned with uh, there's so much of the Word to learn about how to live every day that that's what I spend my time preferably on. And we do know some things from Jewish literature about numbers, like the number 7 represents completion of a task. The number 10 represents completion of an era. So if we combine that, maybe it makes more sense than we think. So given the nature of apocalyptic imagery, most likely 70 weeks, just means the entirety of the Messianic work that now has been completed in Jesus Christ. And if that's a simple approach, maybe too simple for some to want to enjoy, but I quite frankly keeping it simple. I enjoy keeping it simple, <laughs> contrary to popular opinion. Um, but anyway, so the first part of Daniel is very motivational. But we'll conclude with this theme, and it's just worth our time. The faith and integrity of Daniel and I reference Hebrews chapter 11, I think, there too. Uh, it mentions, you know, he says, uh, they had the type of faith to do what God said to do just because God says to do it. And the Hebrew writer says, if I didn't mention any of these, I could have mentioned so many more. He actually says in verse 32, if I had more time, I would have mentioned so much more, just like I feel tonight. Time is running out, and I have so much more to say. But Hebrews chapter 11 says, in verse 32, it's worth our time to read this, but boy, yeah. Verse 32 through 38. And what more shall I say for the time, Hebrews eleven thirty two, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets, who though through faith, who through faith, through faith, subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness they were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead back to life again. Others were tortured, look at this, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Wow. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings and chains and imprisonment, stoned, sawn in two, tempted, slain with the sword, wandered about in sheepskins, goats, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. Amen on that. And wandered in deserts and mountains, dens and caves of the earth, literally holes in the ground. When you read that, sometimes to our shame, we ask ourselves, how does it feel to read what others have suffered for Christ? How does their devotion compare to other people's commitment today? And would your current resolve make the Hebrew writer add you to that list? Whew. I sure hope that we have the faith that indeed would count us among the faithful. I know you have a little blank to fill in there on the very last point, and we can summarize this well. You know, we know the story so well of how Daniel was delivered from the lion's den, how his friends did not burn and were delivered from the furnace. We emphasize deliverance, deliverance so much that we fail to emphasize, I think, what the whole book is really telling us. Choose to walk by faith. Even if death is how God delivers you. And you can read chapter 3 and get the idea around verse 17 if that's not what Daniel's friends were thinking but they were all in for a surprise too. But they had faith. They knew God could do it. They just didn't know how. And you know what? Whether he does or doesn't, I'm going to stay faithful. I hope you enjoy reading Daniel, and I hope you enjoy reading some of these parts that will just make your uh, skin tingle with, with a, a spine-chill experience. Uh, it's a great account. And I'm very thankful for Daniel. I respect his work a lot more than I did before even studying for this class, and I hope that you will too. Next up, 